All right, I think we're about to start. So uh, welcome to the Chicago chapter of the Global Association of Risk Professionals. Uh, we have a panel discussion on distressed debt this evening. And I'd like to thank everyone for uh, braving the cold to come on out today. It's uh, one of the coldest days in history of this date in Chicago. And thanks to our uh, panelists that have also uh, come in from the cold. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, DePaul University's Department of Finance for hosting us, and a special thanks to Bosch Software for co-sponsoring the event. My name is Kerry Line, and I'm a steering committee member of the GARP chapter here in Chicago. And I'm also a principal of a, a boutique risk consulting firm here in Chicago. And I'm pleased to present a panel of experts who will really walk, walk us through the distressed credit market in more detail. Uh, I'm, some of you may have this, but I'd like to also recognize that we're being uh, taped here tonight. So uh, for the benefit of all the chapters uh, globally for the Global Association of Risk Professionals. So to my left is Joe Bolotsky. Bolotsky. Bolotsky, sorry. Uh, he's the Vice President and Principal at Brown, Gibbons, Lang & Company, where he focuses on mergers and acquisitions, private placements, financial restructuring assignments, and valuation. Mr. Belosky has more than 10 years of M&A and corporate finance transaction experience with BGL and has worked with privately held and publicly traded companies operating in a variety of sectors, including consumer, healthcare, and industrial. Prior to joining BGL, Mr. Belosky held positions with William Blair and Company and MB Financial Bank. Mr. Belosky holds a Bachelor of Science from Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Uh, and is a University of Chicago Boots School of Business MBA candidate, and he serves on the junior board of directors of the Gift of Adoption Fund. Thanks for coming. Sorry, I'm reading through all these, but uh, second panelist to the, in the middle is Richard Hardy. He is a partner with Ulmer and Byrne LLP. <coughs> Mr. Hardy has more than 30 years of experience counseling large and middle market clients in connection with bankruptcies, receiverships, and insolvency, insolvency litigation. He chairs the firm's creditors' rights and corporate restructuring group. His broad ex experience includes representing debtors, lenders, creditors, committees, and purchasers of distressed businesses and bankruptcy proceedings. Mr. Hardy has been named in Best Lawyers of America and Ohio Super Lawyers in multiple years, and Best Lawyers of America named Mr. Hardy Lawyer of the Year for 2015 in Bankruptcy and Creditor Debtor Rights, Insolvency, and Reorganization Law. He holds a BA from the University of Iowa and a JD from Case Western Reserve's University School of Law. And thanks for attending. And finally, we have Christoph Schneider. He's a senior credit officer at Fifth Third Bank, where he leads the credit administration efforts and the middle market credit group for the Midwest region, which includes northern Indiana, southern Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri. Prior to his current position, Mr. Schneider led the bank's Central Region Middle Market Special Assets Group. Previously, he was a Middle Market's Loan Officer and Underwriter. His Special Assets specializations include early, midterm, and late decline, turnaround restructuring, workouts, and liquidation. Mr. Schneider holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan and an MBA in Finance from Butler University's College of Business. I thought we would, we're going to have this as a very open discussion, which I think allows for better interaction for the panel as well as yourselves. I'll help uh, sort of moderate through. We're thinking about uh, speaking for about an hour and then having some time for questions and then uh, definitely everyone's looking forward to networking after all. Uh, so feel free at any time to ask a question. Uh, and I think that's going to be, and I think the first thing we're going to really talk about is have a sort of a market overview and provide each of the panelists with an opportunity to discuss that topic. And then we're going to dive into uh, the credit management aspect of the market. And then finally, we're going to focus on turnaround and restructurings. With that said, the... Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, so I work for a firm called Brown Gibbons Lang. We're a 25-year-old investment bank. Uh, we are based in Cleveland, Ohio, and we have an office here in Chicago. Uh, we're about 40 investment bankers, just about evenly split between Cleveland and Chicago. And 
a good amount of what we do is sell side M&A, um, and that's largely what we have going on today. Our firm has about 20 uh, sell side transactions going on right now, and the vast majority of them, and I'll say nearly uh, 95% of those transactions are what I consider healthy deals. Um, historically, we had a, a lot more you know, distress deals. Um, we've worked on plenty of uh, situations where we are uh, going through a bankruptcy process, uh, using a 363 process to, to, to sell some assets, uh, refinancing uh, debt, typically representing um, the, the debtor. Um, uh, this market is, is very hot. And... You know, going through the downturn, this past downturn, we, we saw a lot of uh, amending of loans. Uh, banks realized that uh, they couldn't just you know, pull the trigger, liquidate assets, and, and, and try to recover as much of the principal as they, they could. They had to hunker down, amend the loan, and just hope they get spit out of the other side intact. And today, the businesses that are intact, the, uh, the banks that did stick with the company are now forcing the business to go through a transaction, or the private equity investors that held the company are looking to <coughs> transact, because this is a very hot market. Um, valuations are very strong. Uh, there's plenty of capital out there from strategic buyers and private equity buyers. So we are working with a lot of companies that uh, had some distressed situation in the past. Uh, they had a, a loan reamended in some cases more than more than once um, and they are now looking to uh, to, to get out of these get out of these loans uh, we've, we've, we know a lot of banks have kind of cleaned house uh, for the most part and and you know are not sitting on many distressed um, assets and, and workout groups um, so we're seeing a lot of activity right now um, uh, you know getting you know, helping companies get out of these credits that they've They've been in for a while. Um, I, I will say we're, we're seeing some pretty uh, uh, liberal terms on on debt, and it looks like um, you know when 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 there is a correction in the market or when we do cycle, um, I, I expect to see a lot of distressed activity because uh, right now we're seeing lenders getting very aggressive um, with leverage multiples. We're seeing. You know, middle market companies putting five to six times EBITDA on their balance sheet and putting very you know, covenant light loans um, you know, on these companies, where you know, if, if the market does slow down, if, if the economy does slow down, um, you know, these companies are going to have a lot of debt to, 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 to repay. Um, we're, we're seeing you know, very, obviously, low interest rates and you know, very um, aggressive spreads, you know, even with a very low interest rate environment, we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of competition for credits pushing these spreads down you know, really low. Um, you know, a lot of these these uh, credits are variable rate loans. So when um, you know when the market when interest rates finally do come up, um, they're going to see the, the debt service, uh, you know, the coverage, the, the interest that they have to pay on these loans to go up considerably. Um, so yeah, I think we're we're uh, you know from an investment banker's point of view, it's a very fun market because valuations are strong. There's a lot of buyers out there. From a from a banker's um, from a commercial banking perspective, finally getting out of these credits that they've survived um, you know for for a long time. But um, so you know that's all that's all positive. Um, but you know seeing some uh, some pretty aggressive. Um, uh, lending going on, which will, when the market does correct itself, will will lend or uh, will turn into um, a pretty, a pretty interesting uh, restructuring market. Did you say it's two thousand four or two thousand seven? Uh, you know, two thousand four, you had the same type of thing. Everybody said, well, it kept going on and going on. Two thousand five. Yeah, you know, I would say um, uh, we're probably not. 2007, um, because you, you know you had a lot of uh, housing-related you know money uh, coming you know playing into the market dynamics, um, but I, I do I, I do think that the terms we're seeing um, today with with loans.
covenant light. You, you know, you hear this this um, this term called pick toggle, which essentially means when the company doesn't have enough money to pay the loan, then they could just turn on and they could accrue that interest on on the balance sheet instead of paying the uh, the interest in cash. We are seeing those those things pop up, those dynamics. So when you hear something like pick toggle going on, you know, you're like, oh, this kind of it feels like 2006, 2007. <coughs> Um, but I, I, I don't I don't think the market is is um, uh, is that imbalanced uh, relative to that that o six o seven time frame. So um, for all the reasons that Joseph mentioned, these are good times in the marketplace for everybody else. That means it's a lousy time to be a bankruptcy lawyer. Frankly, <laughs> we we don't have um, not a lot of bankruptcies filed any place in the these days for reasons that go beyond the market. Maybe I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, but there is there's a lot of cash out there when you do have distressed companies. There's a lot of ways to get the, um, the deals done without need for, um, for ending up in a bankruptcy court. Um, it's been kind of a tough market for bankruptcy lawyers, frankly, for the last several years. And again, for the reasons Joseph already mentioned, the, um, the banks were kicking the can down the road. They would amend the loans over and over again, which again meant not a lot of work for guys that do what I do, but, um, but in many cases that's turned out to be a good thing because we're now at a point where the banks are in a position to push, push the, their borrowers hard enough to, to get them out of the bank and the banks are, are getting paid, if not if are something close to it. Um, but um, that being said, uh, and again I think we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later when we talk about acquisitions and divestitures and of a distressed market, there's always companies in trouble. There are always reasons for uh, folks like me to be involved with um, working on transactions to to solve uh, problems that distressed businesses have and make sure we do it in a way that doesn't uh, raise fraudulent conveyance issues, for example. Um, there's a lot of different mechanisms outside of the bankruptcy court to get these deals done. Uh, the banks, in most instances, I'm just talking generally or generically now, the banks in most instances do not want to support companies going into Chapter 11 because it is a very expensive process and that expense often comes out of, at least in part, out of the bank's collateral. So there's very little support on the bank side for companies going to bankruptcy. So we're often solving the, the problems of distressed businesses with um, out-of-court resolutions. It could be Article 9 sales. It can be straight out recompositions or restructuring of, of obligations to creditors, um, if you can get that done consensually. Um, receiverships in many states, uh, including where I practice primarily, Ohio, um, are becoming used more and more, and the state court judges are becoming more and more sophisticated about allowing receivers to run businesses. It used to be receivership meant liquidation. That's all there was. A receiver came in and sold off assets. Nowadays, many state courts are permitting receivers to operate businesses for a period of time until there's an opportunity to get that business sold as a going business. Um, and, and of course, you know, whether I'm on the debtor side or the creditor side, for the most part, our interest is maximizing the value of the business, the assets that are there, and that often usually means um, trying to keep the business alive long enough that it can be sold as a, as a going business. So as I say, good times for everybody else are lousy times for, for, for me. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, to, to many of the points Joe made earlier in the commercial banking market, we're seeing um, banks are competing very heavily for for assets right now. Um, terms, I think, to answer your question from earlier, it feels a lot like 2006. Um, spreads are are being compressed on on general commercial banking transactions. But what lacked in 2009 and 2010 was a refinance market. So much of the issues that they're saying banks were kicking the can down the road, a lot of it was because in a workout, in a pre-stage workout, your secondary source of repayment is a refinance from another lender, which didn't exist in 2009 and 2010 because the market was so tight. Um, what we're seeing right now is 
commercial banks are struggling with the regulatory environment and all the shifts we're seeing in the in the regular in the regulators posture toward leverage lending and what's happening with that is the shadow banking market is just filling the void and um, much to Joe's comments earlier with pick toggles and rich multiples at five and six times EBITDA are being done by shadow banks in a, in a unit tranche transaction whereas a commercial bank would have to do a, a typical standard leverage loan and then have to bring in other capital providers to do the other layers of the balance sheet. So um, it's an incredibly tough environment in commercial banking. Um, but to, to my counterpart's comments earlier here, um, we are seeing more options for exiting transactions that are in trouble. Um, and there is a very robust distressed uh, buyer group across the country who have an appetite to buy distressed assets. So just because you have a distressed credit doesn't mean that you're stuck and you won't be able to get out of it. There are, there are a lot of buyers who are bidding prices up that I think I think your prospects of a, of a decent recovery on a, a loan that could result in a long-term workout are, are fairly good just because there's a lot of liquidity in the market for, uh, for distressed transactions. So. Can you address the, um, you know, you're saying a lot of and by shadow banking, that means non banks like either mm -hmm. credit unions or like some of your biggest roles in startups are like with one of those companies that are song and dance. If you need a, if you need a million dollars now, you've been in business a year, what's that one? Always on TV advertising. We've so never heard of it before. Like you said, the second tier type of letters. Yeah. Where are they getting their money from? From you guys? And are they in the top tier? Or why, why are they able to lend? Like they, they're saying the big guys are probably lending money to the small business people. They're lending it to your top tier people and your credit unions and your, like you said, your second tier people mm -hmm. are putting the money out to the small businesses to make everything develop. Um, well, there are a lot of niche finance firms that focused on asset-based transactions, for instance, which get their capital sources from, from private individuals. Um, insurance companies have uh, fixed um, fixed income shops that oftentimes will invest in, in um, bank like debt. Um, uh, there are a lot of shops like Madison Capital Funding, for instance, is a New York a division of New York Life. Um, they are they are financing a lot of sponsored sponsored transactions right now. So is there different classes of shadow banking you're saying, or different people like no, you? I think there's I, insurance companies, there's a credit union. Is there any are any of the like the Fed or the, the, the Fed in Japan or the Fed in China, there's rumors that a lot of that money being pumped in the U.S. economy is from the different Feds. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything like that? Well, I, I mean, the shadow banking shadow banking is a term that's very generic. I mean, it sort of encompasses everything that is not bank that's lending money like a bank would in a senior debt transaction. So, um, so I would say any and all of those firms that you listed would be included in the shadow banking market. Um, one of the challenges I think that the Federal Reserve and the OCC and the FDIC have right now is they're placing restrictions on bank holding companies that they regulate on leverage lending and are trying to tamp down some of the activity in that market. And the shadow banks don't have to play by those rules. So they are hoping that they can label certain firms systemically important so that they do fall under their purview and can tamp down some of the heat. What was that term you used um, to refinance? Pick or what? Yeah, pick toggle. Pick meaning uh, payment in kind. Oh, okay, so is that, did that come to involved when you had the VIP debtor in possession where the different debtors from, would take over different bankruptcy things? Where instead of defaulting on a bond and depending on how much you default, say if you default for a year, you have to pay all that back interest before you can bring it up again? Or how does that work? Well, actually, the, the pick toggle feature um, would would allow the company to stay in compliance with the loan. So, but if they went out of compliance with the loan, then you know, there could be a, you know, a, a a conversation behind closed doors about as how do we amend this loan. So they could be doing some so concept. So reset like that. with a new pick toggle, or is... well, we're seeing a lot of new loans have this pick toggle feature um, in them. Not 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 a lot. You're hearing the term again. And and I said when you when you hear that term again, 
then you got to sort of think, hey, um, people are getting very aggressive. Lenders are getting very aggressive. Yeah, ba banks aren't, aren't doing pick time. Yeah. yeah. We, we, need, we need cash interest. Right. <laughs> right. Well, it's just a different way to leverage. That's what I'm trying to figure out because he's saying they're 5 to 1. Back in the heyday in 06, they were like 20 to 1, 30 to 1 on mm -hmm. some of the stuff. So I'm just wondering if that's a, a way or a, a financial injury way of getting around that different type of leverage. Uh, well, a lender would, would want to do, not, not a bank, because bank capital is very impatient, but, but a more patient lender might be willing to agree to receive his interest at a later date when when times might not be so challenged. Um, so the company is is agreeing contractually that they'll pay that just sometime later. Um, well, uh, well, the lender would have, if the borrower fell into payment default, they didn't have a pick toggle feature on a loan? Is that what you're asking? Alternative to, to, to turn it, turn it. Yeah, uh, I, well, the borrower would have to come to the lender and say, I'm in default and I right. need so payment relief. Yeah, it's effectively a way to delay mm -hmm. dealing with an issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you see that in loan transactions, that means you have lenders that are more patient for a variety of reasons. It may be competition. It may be that they just like the underlying asset that would repay them, and they believe that the that the repayment prospects are very strong, and would be willing to forego cash payments for a bump in the road. So, oh, we had a question uh, prepared. That are there any concentrations geographically or industry wise, or in this business cycle, or potential changes in business cycle that may be more impacted? Um, coming up? Well, I think energy is obviously on pretty much everybody's mind. Um, oil prices do great things for the economy because it puts extra money in everybody's paychecks, but um, or in their, in their pockets, I should say. But um, but it also, the oil industry, the energy industry is, is very nervous right now. Anybody with exposure to energy is certainly thinking very hard about whether they want exposure to that right now. Um, I know Fifth Third and a lot of regional banks have energy lending practices, and we're reviewing those loans on a very regular basis to make sure that we're not seeing cracks in the foundation um, for our repayment prospects. And is that across all energy markets, including Um, I'm just speaking from my experience. Um, uh, coal is, is a really challenging market. It has been for a while. Um, um, I think he's saying solar versus wind versus normal type of energy, right? Alternative. Well, a lot of the activity that went on in that was driven by tax credits mm -hmm. and regulation. Right. Um, I mean, th that always brings with it a, a, a whole set of different challenges because when Congress turns over and you have a different party in control, they may have a different set of objectives. So if you have exposure to an industry like that, you need to be monitoring legislative changes that could, that could very much change the landscape that, that's supporting your transaction. So, I'm yeah, so in Richard's thoughts on whether the, the energy as a good or a service in a bankruptcy proceeding and how that affects kind of recovery around Sorry, the question is, if you're an unsecured creditor in a, uh, an energy case... Of, in an energy case, the, the debate about whether electricity and gas are either a good or a service, and how that kind of plays into how much you're going to recover in terms of cents on the dollar, if you have any ideas around that. I don't think it's going to have much effect on an unsecured creditor, whether or not it turns out that that's a... Uh, is it defined as a commodity, or... Well, yeah. for the bankruptcy code purposes, but the part of the world that I deal with is not really going to make a whole lot of difference. So the economics of the of the bankruptcy itself are going to be simply a matter of, of 
Who are the secured lenders? Are they undersecured? If they are, it isn't going to make a whole lot of difference in terms of the unsecured's recovery, whether or not we're talking about goods or services. And, and by the way, the, there are there have been very, very few oil and gas. In fact, the very, very first bankruptcy I ever handled was of a small oil and gas uh, company. Um, but there have been very few of those uh, filings in, in recent years, although I do wonder whether or not we're going to start seeing some of the, there's a, obviously a huge industry that's involved in supporting and supplying the oil and gas business. Those are the guys that I worry most about. Just like a few years ago, I was seeing a lot more activity with the Tier 2 and Tier 3 auto suppliers than I wasn't worried about GM going into bankruptcy or four. Maybe I should have been. Uh, but but we saw it in the Midwest, obviously, in Michigan, Ohio, and the places that uh, where I roam, um, I handle a lot of Tier 2 and particularly Tier 3 suppliers, uh, some with bankruptcies, but often out-of-court workouts. And in fact, a lot of those out-of-court workouts actually were, um, were were supported by the auto manufacturers themselves. That may be what will happen in some of these. Like accommodation agreements? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And that sort of thing may have to happen in the oil gas industry. Too. Accommodation agreements? So uh, it's a three-party agreement between a creditor, the automaker, and the borrower. Everybody's sort of acknowledging their role in the process. <laughs> What's that? Um, which part? Which party? Well, it depends on which hand you are. If you're, if you're the steel supplier, you're the, the lender to the steel supplier. You can't afford to pay the bank now. But then they'll say, "We'll have the money once we're putting in the car production." Um, there's, you could be three or four different people. Well, you, you, usually, it usually it involves the automaker agreeing to accelerate payment on certain parts because they're critical parts mm -hmm. and the lender is agreeing to enter into the transaction because it keeps its borrower alive with the repayment prospects for its loan and the borrower obviously would agree to it because they get to keep their employees employed on the line and and, and fight live to fight another day I guess. Yeah. Have you guys ever heard of AVNIC credit? Av AVNIC? Yeah. Yeah. This is a story that was in Crane's um, they're the biggest, fastest growing startup in Chicago since Groupon. And this guy who runs it, his name is Al Goldstein, he's 34 years old. He's launched two of these companies, and basically they have lent out over a billion dollars just like in the last year, and they have people throwing money at them. From Tiger Management, KKR, Peter Thiel, the, the founder, and all that. That's why I was addressing that shadow banking thing. I'm like, up until last week, I've never heard of these guys. And I asked a bunch of bankers, and they're like, we never heard of them. But then there's some tier bankers that actually have heard of them that they're the fastest growing lender there is in the city of Chicago and the Midwest, and now they're going to Europe. Huh. You know, mm -hmm. I think yeah, right. I don't think I've heard of them. What what sort of transactions are they writing? Um, well, you can read the whole article. Basically, in two years, loans on Stanley are nearing a billion dollars. Um, they're making $200 million in revenue. Uh, they, they, they employ more than 500 people in Chicago. I mean, and their fundraising base is like nothing has been seen in two decades. This they have, what, this they have a crazy. billion outstanding, yeah. and they generated two hundred million. Well, that's what I can't figure out. Because that's an awful big return on money, isn't that? Uh, I mean, I'm not a calculus major, but yeah. I, doing the math in my head, that's about twenty percent. So that. <clears throat> oh. To address the shadow banking thing. Um, from an investment banker's perspective, you know, when I first started in this business 10 years ago, the list of banks were you know, Fifth Third and J.P. Morgan and kind of your traditional banks. Now the list includes, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll say the, the you know, these shadow banking uh, entities, and you're asking where the money was coming from. We're seeing a lot of these uh, business development corporations, BDCs, who are raising money in the public markets. Um, or you're, you're seeing hedge funds open up a a private. You know, That's what these guys are getting funding directly instead of going to the banks. They're, they're getting it from the banks, and like Peter Thiel, he's a starter of PayPal for the audience to say how you say the names. And these other guys are prominent hedge fund guys. Yeah. They're saying, you know what? The banks are too cumbersome. They have too much overhead. But guess what? We're going to go directly to the people, and it takes away that big layer. And now, sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I doubt they're going around. Uh, 
Well, that, this, um, this says that he expects a critical source of his funding to come from securitization, so he's going to package all these loan receivables. Up. But he gets it done. Yeah, that's why I'm no. asking if you guys have seen it. Yeah. No, I, 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 well, you've definitely piqued my interest. I, I will yeah, go home and read about it. It's called the, the, the <laughs> June 8th and securitization before they all went under. That was the term in Wall Street back. Where they, they put them all together. I actually remember the primary dealers that actually put them together. That's right. Mm -hmm. If it's to the point that uh, kind of um, tying the point, your point together with the point I was going to make, is you're seeing these hedge funds now have, um, you know, they're competing with the banks. You know, they're they're investing in or they're underwriting uh, these these business loans that are high highly leveraged, you know, low interest rates uh, with pick toggles and things like that. So just the competition out there now includes not only the commercial banks like it did before, kind of what. They were the only ones there before, and now you got you know the hedge funds, these BDCs, and all these other sources coming into the market and competing with the with commercial banks. But by the compliance costs for banks, of their things become so enormous that if, if, if somebody like a hedge fund is going to lend, they don't have to follow those compliance costs because they're not frank. Exactly. So is it hindering her? I would think it's it's doing both in, in as far as the bank. So you, uh, the banks are shifting; they're not bankers anymore; they're facilitators. Maybe because of there's too much compliance, or I, I don't know. It's a, it's, I just see things. I've been doing this for 39 years, but in the last two or three years, I've seen a change from banks and channel lending to different types of people and using different types of leverage ratios to get things done. Or, but I never heard that term. I like that term. I think it mm -hmm. basically says, guess what? Humble, let's redo it. <coughs> Actually, that might be a great segue into one of the thing, one of the topics I think that was on the list. Um, so. A commercial bank, by charter, doesn't want to own and operate a business. It's in the business of making loans. <clears throat> but a hedge fund, as a lender, may have different objectives or, at, or like to have a different set of options as a lender by making a loan transaction because he can own and operate a business should it not work out, um, which which would make him a more patient lender well, than a we're bank. Going, we're going to the other question. I don't want to hit you. So, I, well, I, I was going to, I think one of the topics in the restructuring area was sort of about, about loan to own strategies, and I kind of watered it down into, <laughs> into the mm -hmm. basics. I mean, yeah. I think that's kind of an interesting topic of discussion right now in the distressed credit world. Yeah, and, and you're right. First of all, it's obviously a huge competitive advantage for these hedge funds equity funds, there's, you know, there's these family offices, there's all sorts of money, since, since we do have that 1% that, that seem to control so much of the capital in the United States right now, and they're looking for places to put it, and do you really want to put it in the bank at those interest rates, or buy a bond, or what have you, or do you want to, yeah, or do you want to look for that 20% return, right? <laughs> um, so, so there's just a lot of money um, floating out there, and uh, and, and, and that's correct. That if you this loan to own strategy is a very popular strategy now. Banks couldn't do it, but hedge funds can do it. The loan to own essentially means um, when Fifth Third is um, has an issue with its with its borrowers in default, and it's done with the loan, it wants it wants out, and and for it's determined that if it can get fifty cents on the dollar, eighty cents on the dollar, whatever the number is, it'll be real willing to sell its loan to. To third party, well, the hedge fund or whoever the party may be, who's interested in acquiring the underlying business, is willing to uh, acquire Fifth Third's loan and obviously all of its security interests, um, and continue on as the lender for a, a period of time. In most cases, though, that's a short period of time because the plan is to um, to do some negotiation, work out an arrangement uh, where there will be a um, we'll put the company in the bankruptcy for a very short period. All for the purpose of running a an auction sale, a three sixty three sale, as it's called in the bankruptcy code. Um, with that hedge fund being the party that hopes to acquire the underlying business, and the huge competitive advantage it has if it follows that strategy is it's just paid fifty million dollars for a loan that's going to face value of a hundred million dollars. When it goes into bankruptcy court, uh, subject to some things that I'll talk okay, about in a minute. They're, they're going to go in and say, okay, we're willing to buy uh, the business and we're willing to bid up to $100 million because that's the amount of the loan that we now own, even though they acquired it, obviously, for $50 million. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, I was just reading this morning a, um, a pleading in the, the Radio Shack case. Um, Radio Shack, as most, most of you know, filed bankruptcy just a couple weeks ago, and this is the classic strategy that's being employed there. Um, and if it acquired the senior lender's loan, um, it pushed very hard for Radio Shack to go into bankruptcy. It is now pushing extremely hard to get a very quick um, uh, bidding process put together. Hopefully, they hope, have it blessed by the court uh, with, the, with the thought that, uh, yes, we're supposed to have an open, fair, and free auction uh, under the bankruptcy code. You know, the whole idea of the bankruptcy code, obviously, is both equitable treatment of creditors, but also we want to maximize the return to all the creditors. Well, that's like you find people trying to rewrite the bankruptcy code laws to make them quicker, faster, more efficient, like you're saying? That that's before. that's part of what's, yeah, what's happened in recent years. And, and so in this case, um, they're asking for the fa a very fast track auction process. Um, that obviously gives them a huge competitive advantage because they've already done all their due diligence uh, on the company. Um, the fact that they own, a, uh, uh, own the loan and are in a position now credit bid, Base amount of whatever the loan is, or at least they hope they can credit it. And I'll mention, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, may in fact be such a competitive advantage that outside uh, folks that might otherwise have an interest in a company like Radio Shack will say, "Why are we going to spend tens of millions of dollars in due diligence when it looks like these guys are going to come in and sweep it out from uh, from under us?" And uh, as a general rule, that's the way it's supposed to work. There's been a lot of activity in the courts recently where. Um, in this situation where the court determines that the that the um, this party has acted inequitably, that they pushed too hard, they've gotten this, such a huge competitive advantage that they've in fact chilled the the, uh, the bidding, and uh, and it's likely to result in the other creditors not getting a fair return for the uh, for the assets being sold. Uh, in some cases, the courts have said you cannot credit bid at all, or in some cases they've limited the credit bidding to the amount that that Acquire, the loan acquirer uh, paid for uh, the loan. And, uh, and so there's been a lot of activity in, in that area. And I think we'll see at least challenges in the Radio Shack case. Uh, uh, you can see the ones that are coming down the road. Yeah. Yes. You know, there's Sears is, is at risk Sears, these days. Yes, as people know. Sears, Edge, Uh, sometimes they're aware of it, sometimes they're not. Sometimes uh, they're surprised with a phone sometimes call. Sometimes they're surprised with a phone call when they say, I'm your new lender. Um, uh, I don't think that that's done maliciously, but it's um, if you're selling a loan to another party and they're buying it, they may not want the borrower to be aware of it because they don't want them to do something to change anything. One senior lender sold its its loan to this other party, and I wasn't involved. I have no idea whether or not the Radio Shack was fully aware or knew nothing about that transaction. I mean, in savvy bankers in a competitive market, right? The, the borrower is negotiating approval rights over transfers of loan positions and all that mm -hmm. stuff today, right? So I think maybe some of these are a little before that was commonplace, and obviously the companies we're talking about don't know a lot of leverage with their bankers. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen provisions added. Um, a lot of times there is a default provision to that, though. So if they're, if they're in default, that sort of changes things. But they just don't want banks transferring their loan around. I mean, you see, fine. the term default is, is a new meaning because you pick the strategy and basically a default. And by using that term, <coughs> you go to court, the judge is going to say, what the hell is that? Technically, that should be in default, but the judge is going to say, well, guess what? You got a new term. What do you call it? Pick and roll? Or, or, <laughs> Pick and roll. <laughs> but that's a good thing because see, you're, you're an attorney. You would recognize, uh, you know, and a judge would recognize that term. You're not going to recognize this term. That's what I'm saying. They're using financial engineering or financial restructuring to get around a, a lot of that old type of bankruptcy or things are happening. But this is all about, like, like everything, this is all about leverage, isn't it? So, yeah. so when the loan is entered into, the borrower especially in this environment, it's got a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. to, to, 
mm-hmm. to do loans with a variety of banks. And so they say, okay, one of the things I want in my loan documents is you're not going to sell my loan. I want to deal with Fifth Third Bank and, or Chase or whoever and nobody else. And I want the but, right to cure defaults. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right, right. But there comes a point in time where, um, uh, where when they're in default, and uh, number one, the usual provision would be the ability to say no to a sale goes away once you once you stop making payments under the under the loan. But secondly, suppose it didn't go away. Uh, what's the leverage here? Well, uh, if you say to the bank you cannot sell my loan, and the bank says, well, I guess my other alternative then is to liquidate you today, put you in default. Well, well, what's the whole idea of the, of the agreement out of the bill, and it's just the way, like you said, they can leverage. If you don't like it, guess what? We'll take it somewhere else, and somebody's got it. And they'll take it down. One way or the other. So, okay. Chris, if I have a question, we talked about it at lunch. Um, how the regulators, especially recently, mm-hmm. sort of, with another sort of soft sledgehammer said, told banks uh, to be careful about leverage lending. Mm-hmm. Can you sort of Talk about that a little bit, how that yeah. may have changed. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think this last SNCC exam that happened in 2014, for those of you who don't know what the SNCC is, it's the Shared National Credit exam that happens every year. Um, those are for loans that have three or more uh, commercial banks in them that exceed $20 million. Um, a lot of those loans are financing leverage transactions, and the Fed, OCC, and the FDIC are sort of disappointed in banks' underwriting processes. They think they're a little weak. Um, I mean, they feel Morgan is the biggest abuser, right? Well, I, they didn't single anybody out in their in their joint statement, but um, there was a big thing on Bloomberg was it yesterday or today. Huh? And bank, Citibank, JP Morgan, you know, they had the different ratings. And mm. they like to come up with their own tricks. So what the heck did we do? We didn't learn anything. And he's smiling because, hey, it's a lot more business coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for those interest rates to go up. I'm the only guy, I'm the only guy rooting for that, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, they, um, I, that has a lot of banks nervous about what the regulators might do if they don't cool down their leverage lending activities, um, which is sort of pushing more and more transactions to the shadow banking market, which is full of cash and Ready to write checks. So, um, absolutely. Yeah, they they want to make the banks safer, and, and well, they want yeah, us to hold the, more capital. And but it's pushing all the loans into weaker hands than they were before. And the loan outstanding has increased by like twenty-seven trillion dollars just over the last six years. They came out with some figure on that, and it's basically. In Instead of the hands of five or six of the bigger bankers now, it's basically, like you said, the, the shadow different bankers, wherever they're getting their money from or how they're defined. But if you have credit, you get a hedge fund, a, a mom and pop family office, or a different type of thing. Mm-hmm. So, I have a question. How would that affect the U.S. economy in the event that, say, that shift occurred if it is occurring? And uh, sometimes economic crisis occur within that. Where would that come to? Oh, I, can I just, I'm getting a little signal saying that um, the taped audience won't be able to hear any of the questions. So if, oh. if you're going to take it on, can you just sort of give a brief synopsis of what the question is and then... Sure. And we may need to... Yeah. Uh, could you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> put, put it in the hot seat. So, so say, uh, Um, so the, the question is, what would happen if there were a lot of defaults in the shadow banking market? I'm going to make sure I paraphrase this right. A lot of defaults in the shadow banking market if there was a major stumble in the economy. Yeah, that didn't necessarily affect the banks because the regulators accomplished what they were looking to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, 
I mean, my counterparts might have a, a different opinion than I do, but um, I still think it's going to create a liquidity issue um, in the market. You're going to have um, you're going to have a lot of lenders dealing with problem loans and trying to dispose of them, um, which will will cause them to retreat in making new loans. Um, uh, I would think that if that were to happen, similar to 2010 and 11. The commercial banks will probably pick up some of the slack and because you multiple people are you guys to go in there and, uh, as, a, as a commercial bank in order to basically put your finger in a dike when everything is collapsing? What was the opposite? That was the second part of my question. Well, I mean, how do they pump liquidity into that, you know, like they did with the banks? And... Yeah, I, I think that's the question everyone's trying to answer right now. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, yeah. If they're not systemically important, um, I mean, it creates moral hazard if they're constantly bailing everybody out. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, in 2010 and 2011, when, when leverage multiples came down and when, when transaction multiples came down, um, and the, the shadow banking market was not originating a lot of transactions because they were licking their wounds from their rich, rich multiple deals uh, from, from before the economic crisis happened, um, you know, commercial banks were originating a lot of those assets. In fact, the market was very strong for leveraged loans at that point because um, we could command much stronger pricing and yield than we would on a normal middle market loan. There were floors on LIBOR. Um, 2006 or 2008 strong? What? I'm sorry. As far as, you know, the lending, when it gets, you know, if you back to the question, does it look like 2006 or 2008 as far as is there a lot more greed out there or fear? Um, I, I, that's a good question. I, uh, I, I mean, these are sophisticated people. There's, I don't know that there's fear or greed. It's just they have an appetite for risk or they don't. Well, that's just in a way to define the yeah. yeah. for this. I guess. I mean, I, I, sure. So is there more fear out there or more greed? Um... I think it depends on what seat you're sitting in. I think there are a lot of people who are cautiously optimistic right now. Bridget, you talked about um, you're looking forward to the day the interest rates start rising again. Can you give an overview of your view on that and how it's been different with this extended low interest rate environment and how things may change if and when that starts moving? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, just historically, um, there's obviously been much more of a of peaks and troughs in uh, in my business, first of all, and in interest rates generally. My business obviously t tends to pick up when interest rates uh, rise, but this has been, uh, I guess, a historically long environment of low interest rates. And uh, I've been talking to people and going to seminars and hearing for probably five years now, longer or longer, that uh, it's, it's just another couple quarters and, and the interest rates are going to finally come back up a bit, but uh, uh, but it hasn't happened uh, so far. And, uh, and, and and again, just to, um, to tell you a little bit about the bankruptcy world, even when it does happen, I'm not anticipating that means a lot more um, bankruptcy filings as such. There'll be more distressed companies. Um, but at least right now, of course, there is a lot of cash. E even now, there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. There's still ways to <coughs> to deal with companies that go into distress if the sole issue is the interest rates have risen and they've otherwise got fundamentally a business that's got some some value and some wherewithal. Um, and for a variety of reasons, um, primarily the, um, the changes in the, in the bankruptcy code that occurred several years ago, again, bankruptcy is incredibly it's an incredibly expensive uh, process, uh, incredibly time-consuming for everybody involved. Uh, there is a lot more uncertainty for the debtors. You know, typically the debtor is the party that decides to file bankruptcy. Yes, three uh, three unsecured creditors, three creditors can determine decide to file an involuntary bankruptcy. But even though you hear about those, those are very <coughs> rare. Typically, it's the debtor deciding to file. So if you're a debtor deciding to file, you're going to do it because you you've come up with some kind of an exit strategy that allows you to retain control of the business. Typically, well, Congress changed the law, and I, I, don't, I guess it's been almost ten years ago. Changed a lot of, to give the debtor uh, a lot less of control over the bankruptcy process than they used to have. It used to be, 
you could file your bankruptcy and <coughs> hang around for three, four, five years, um, keep negotiating with creditors, finally wear them down, uh, and uh, and end up with a reorganization plan that works for you, allows management to stay in control, etc. Well, the code has changed. There's some very strict limitations on how long you will have the exclusive right to file. And once you lose exclusivity, it means <coughs> the creditors committee can join up with some hedge fund, yes, some kind of vulture is going to come in and decide what the value of the company really is and, and, and put their own plan together to acquire the business. So, so again, for a variety of reasons, even when, rate, when rates come up, I expect there'll be more insolvency work for folks like me, there'll be more distressed deals being done, but they will probably not be Chapter 11 bankruptcy cases. I have a question for you. Uh, we're in a global economy now, and you know, we're talking about the U.S. laws, obviously, to maybe specific, Laws in certain situations, but are there any lessons to be learned from what's happened, for instance, as we imagine in Japan with the whole notion of banks, you know, waiting for real estate in Tokyo to come back up to the price where where it was back in the back in the eighties? Is there some, or, or in Europe, are, are there any lessons that maybe have been gotten from overseas that can be applied to what has happened? In, in my world, I'll just tell you that the, that our, the United States Bankruptcy Code is, um, I'm not sure it's, if it's the envy, envy of the world, but most people think we have the, the best mechanism for restructuring businesses, uh, better than Canada's got one where the, the secured creditor is pretty much in control. Some of the European countries, it's pretty much a straight bank-controlled liquidation for the most part. But, um, um, in Greece, they have none. <laughs> yeah. Ger uh, Germany revised their code to make it look more like the U.S. code? I know there was talk about that. If it's actually happened, I'm, I'm not aware. But okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting that that could be coming up with reason that you're like you said, take it down again as their own choice so they don't have to, I don't know if you call it right off or mark down or whatever. And then they can come up with that new term and say, <laughs> that's the fault that they didn't default. They didn't. Big kick. Well, um, we, we, we talked, we, we met a little earlier today and kind of talked through some of these topics. Um, so the question is, are banks better at recognizing risk sooner? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there, there's a concept right now in, uh, that, that a lot of banks are dealing with, which is establishing, um, if they don't already have them, first lines of defense, second lines of defense, third lines of defense. And um, the banks that don't have three lines of defense um, are quickly trying to get them together. Um, I would say that because of the regulatory scrutiny, um, because of the, uh, the need for us to accurately rate borrowers and credits timely, um, because of the additional oversight, um, and how those play into the new capital allocation rules and everything else, um, it will force banks, if they aren't already, to recognize risk sooner. Um, it probably as an industry, we will be better at it. I, and that would be my opinion. Yeah, comp competition does does interesting things to yeah. ration, <laughs> rationality, I guess. Yeah. Um, but they still know that if somebody else is taking more risk and making more money, then that's yeah. the business you're Yes and no, because, I mean, how, 
how would you forecast if real estate rises, let's say, for 10 years in a row, how would you forecast when the downturn comes? And when you make, when you make a loan in year six, how would you know that real estate wouldn't rise for another four years? And what kind of real estate, what the location? It, it's, it, it's an interesting question. Um, it requires really robust modeling. Um, and if you don't do it, some competitor will. So if you're earning a very low yield on an asset, and you need more assets to generate more revenue, you may do something that appears irrational at the time uh, because you think you can second guess what the outcome might be. So, so I, it's an interesting observation. Yes, banks, maybe if you're looking from the outside in, should be good gaugers of the amount of risk that they're taking, but not always because it's hard to quantify. And, and I, can't, I can't speak necessarily to it from a commercial banker's perspective, whether they are so kind of in tune with the true level of risk they're taking on, but from our perspective, where we help companies raise capital from various sources, we're seeing the, you know, the shadow banking market, the, the BDCs, the hedge funds, coming in with very aggressive terms, and in order for commercial banks to make loans, you know, they have to make loans, they have to be competitive, and we, we sense a good amount of hesitation when we pick up the phone and say, oh, you know, you guys are going to, you commercial bank, you're going to lose this lending opportunity if you don't pull down your interest rate, if you don't pull down the required amortization of the loan. I, I think that they're cognizant of what they're doing, but in order to be competitive and actually make that loan and, or retain that client, they're, they're getting aggressive. disagree whether the banks are aware or not aware of what the risks are, but I think everyone understands that the banks like to convey that they are more aware of it than they actually are. And so people, you know, they, here are our models, here are our ratings, here's how we assign a, a rating to this credit and so forth, and then you go behind the scenes and you find it's all like darts and small <laughs> and, and, so, and so you have a bank actually say, we're making loans, we really don't know how risky this is. Mm -hmm. they, you typically don't hear it. You hear someone say in a very you know measured tone of, well, we've evaluated these, these, and these, and we assume it's this percent. And, and so the perception that in the past we've had the things where afterwards it was clear that they didn't know mm -hmm. and the models were inadequate. Mm -hmm. But right up front, I think the idea of people having a model, do they have that sense of we have our model, but, and then have, here's how it may not work. It mm -hmm. tends not to be done from a marketing perspective, and I don't know if that affects, like, the, does someone then hear that pitch and then believe it? You know, do they actually say, oh, yeah, it's all under control. Don't worry, they have a department called the Risk Control Department, so they must be controlling their risks. So, so is it, you know, we got to where maybe people understand that things that might be fuzzier in the quantitative realm than, than people who are not in quants may think they are. Um, yeah, I, I mean... There's definitely more. There's definitely more emphasis on saying what could happen. Uh, probably more so than was happening before the, the disaster of 2008. Um, but again, when when you're in a competitive situation, um, your bias may change toward thinking things might be better than they are. Um, so you're still dealing with human behavior. Um, and, and and I mean. A lot of what goes into quantifying risk is looking at historical financial information. So you're always looking in the rearview mirror. And just like you said, maybe the models were inadequate. We know that now. <laughs> we didn't know it at the time. Um, what's the fear of greed index? What's that? The fear of greed index. There's no fear. There's a lot of greed. So people are willing to loan or as they see, the bank see your sub-tier company yeah, so if your fear and greed index is like the pendulum and the, mm -hmm. the, the fear index is I'm not making loans and the greed index is I'm writing every opportunity that walks in the door, we're, we're beyond the middle, let's put it that way, toward the greed side. <laughs> which, which, which one? Which side? We're, we're toward the greed side, I mean, we're writing loans. Okay. We're not, not writing loans. I, I don't get to see the entire portfolios of, of loans, so 
I assume the banks do a good job using the risk models and creating uh, enough diversity, enough diversification in their portfolio that hopefully the models work over a, a, a wide array of loans. But So I see the one-off bad deals. And as you mentioned before, this is all about human behavior that is so, it's too complex, you can't measure it. So I see the situations where the financials have looked great for the last 10 years, only they were prepared um, with folks involved with fraud for, for years and years, embezzlement has gone. I see those situations. I see the, the company that's been well managed for 10 years, but a competitor has come up with a process or product that just makes that, that company. That's it, I mean, it's <laughs> right, exactly. There's got to be some of that. Yeah. yeah. It's like the weather, you know, they're just, it's too complex. There's too many variables involved. It's, it's, it's impossible to create the perfect model. It's going to take every variable into account. Uh, if you can control human behavior, I'll pray you. How about from a policy management perspective? These banks are originating these loans. How are they holding on to these leverage loans? What about restructured loans? How are they holding on to them? Are they maintaining the quality balance sheet as they're going for and then, are these banks um, purchasing securitized, say, you know, loans from the shadow market? Um, you know, what's the appetite of that? How, how does all this stuff play into balance sheet management? Uh, so the question is, how does all this play into balance sheet management in relation to uh, new loan origination and restructured loans? Is that is that sure. fair? Um, well, <coughs> over the last five years, lot, lots of banks have been repairing their balance sheets. They've been working through problem, problem assets. Um, I think if you read most earnings announcements, their uh, levels of criticized loans and classified loans um, have, have reduced as a percentage of their total loan portfolios. Um, where they're challenged is growing. Um, so a lot of the earnings you're seeing in, on, on bank earnings calls are coming from uh, releases of reserves, loan reserves. Because conditions are better, banks are not needing to reserve as much against their loan books, um, which obviously helps the bad, bad earnings in good years when the credit environment's better. And we're seeing delinquency rates back to 2006, 2007 levels, which were, which were very low. Um, and we're seeing overall levels of non-performing assets and, and other real estate owned at, at historically low levels. So according to the report that came out yesterday, they're saying that big banks, 40 to 60 percent of their loans are to the federal government. Are to the federal government? Yeah, to basically lend to the federal government for you know on a day and overnight refunds and all of this thing. Oh yeah, that that very well could be. If you're interested on I mean it was a big report that came out of Bloomberg and they I think they called JP Morgan like a Five, you know, they give different rankings and they had that kind of stuff. And Citibank and all the other banks, and they broke them all down and they did you know, where they're lending to and how all that. I'm sorry, what, does it have an impact on what? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly hard to grow when you have to hold on to more capital. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that we've seen the full effects. I think everybody's kind of preparing for how bad it's going to hurt. <laughs> um, and every, everybody's in various stages of preparing for that. But, I mean, Yeah, it's going to have a pressure on earnings. Um, so we, banks, in a lot of respects, because we have these big branch, collect, you know, deposit collection networks. Uh, they, uh, what call for what are you to? What? A deposit collection network. I mean, oh, we're we're oh, collecting oh, deposits oh. To, to make loans. Um, they're they're very expensive to maintain. Yeah. So we have about five minutes left, and. I you guys have any closing discussions and one would be especially since there's a lot of 
members of the GARP that are starting to look into in their beginning of the career. So they're looking at different certifications and how do they get into the sort of seats that you're in and what would, sort of advice would you give to people that wanted to start getting into um, the distressed market? I guess I, I could go. Um, it may not be you know, distress specific, um, uh, but in investment banking in general, you know, we uh, investment banks recruit undergraduates um, very aggressively, uh, especially when the M and A market is hot. Firms like ours are, are adding you know, more um, young men and women coming coming out of school. So I think the best thing for uh, you know, younger people to do is. Understand what investment banking actually is. And you ask my, my parents, who you know, I've been telling them what I do for the past 10 years, they think, you know, uh, investments, and, but in banking, they're, they're so confused. Do I sell stocks? But really, under, you know, start to understand what investment banking does, um, what types of departments there are in investment banks. There's, you know, there's distress focused investment banks. And Houlihan Loki has a fantastic um, uh, distress practice. You know, learn about that. So really understand the landscape, you know, first and foremost. And then just thinking about the skills you need to get for you know, getting into that market. You know, from, from an investment banker standpoint, you have to know accounting very well. Um, you have to understand, um, you know, how, how businesses keep score and the nuances associated with uh, financial reporting. And you also have to know the finance, um, you know, to understand you know, structuring companies, debt and equity, uh, capitalization, um, cost of capital, all these concepts. Um, so you're know, getting some of those basic kind of skill sets down um, is important, and then you know knowing the, the the lay of the land, and then just getting out and, and networking kind of as much as you can because um, there's there's a whole bunch of internship opportunities and analyst programs and for for MBAs associate programs out there. Um, so getting into investment banking, there's plenty of opportunity, uh, but you just have to you know study where where exactly you want to be. I'm not sure I, I'm a person to answer that question so much <laughs> other than go just to law school. yeah <laughs> go to law school I guess but but it, but I will ju just mention in passing I know we tend to talk about risk and maybe maybe the only kind of risk you guys are interested in is, is uh, financial risk but I am seeing of course in um, in my world uh, risk managers of various kinds in, in all sorts of businesses away from the financial uh, side of the world folks just looking at at uh, models of the business that's being carried on by their employer and determining um, where are we vulnerable? Where are we vulnerable in the area, for example? Well, an obvious one. Or no, no, these are, uh, I'm talking about non legal situations. In fact, my law firm just handled, just hired a risk manager. We're a 200 person firm, sort of a mid sized firm. Um, uh, the large, larger firms than us have been dealing with, uh, had risk professionals on staff before this. Um, if you want to make certain that you've got that your your enterprise has a, has a long life, um, it's great to have one person or one team of folks uh, whose sole job it is to keep looking out there for the for the icebergs. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so uh, even beyond the financial world, I'm suggesting to you that uh, there's a there's a lot of employment opportunities in the sort of in the general category of risk management. Yeah, I mean our our risk division. <coughs> It's easy to think that a bank is only focused on credit risk, but we have operational risk to deal with, we have reputational risk, regulatory risk, legal risk, market risk, liquidity risk. Those are all disciplines within our risk division at Fifth Bank. I happen to be a credit risk focused person, but we have departments that focus on those things. The liquidity risk managers are making sure that the bank has adequate liquidity to meet its obligations. Um, market risk professionals are dealing with our sensitivity to interest rates and currencies and, and other things. I mean, there are lots of lots of different areas to focus in. Um, if you're particularly focused on distress stuff, um, I think um, me being a younger individual, having spent a lot of time in turnaround and workout, is a little unusual because for a long time I think that was kind of reserved for veteran people. I think it's being looked at more as a a real career. Path for, for some individuals who really want to be in the distressed market for their career. Um, there are certifications not offered by GARP, but through other, through other uh, in, uh, organizations like the Turnaround Management Association is a 
certified turnaround professional designation that you can earn um, as a practitioner in turnaround and restructuring. Um, there's the American Insolvency and Restructuring Association um, that offers a CIRA designation, a certified insolvency and restructuring advisor. Um, there is a real career path for people who are interested in the, in the distressed market. Um, uh, if you're going to get into it, um, I, I like, like to, when we have our young associates starting at the bank who are newly minted bankers who have never made a loan, I generally like to tell them that it's probably a good idea to figure out how to make a good loan before you work out of a bad loan, because <laughs> um, you need to know what a good loan looks like first. Um, but it is a, a real discipline that, that is recognized um, in the market. So. When you mentioned the different risk areas in the bank, mm -hmm. you didn't mention cyber risk. It's a rather hot topic. Yeah, well, that, that gets folded into operating risk, um, but that is, that is a real threat to just about every company. I mean, we've seen lots of big names in the media recently. Um, the bank is spending millions of dollars on security to make sure that our uh, databases are safe from hackers um, and people's identities aren't stolen. I mean, it's, it, it is a real... Our clients are actually requiring us to demonstrate that we have a good data security. We're entrusted with intellectual property in right. many cases. Uh, we're not holding anybody's money for the most part, but we've got intellectual property, trade secrets, and um, and legal strategies even. And uh, and our clients are expecting us to demonstrate to them that we are protecting assets that they've given to us. Um, uh, for purposes of you know giving them advice, it's very very important. All right, I'd like to thank our panel of Joe and Richard and Christoph, and I'd also like to recognize um, Anne Gabor, um, who is also on the GARP chapter that really uh, helped <laughs> bring all this together and get the advice out as well. And thanks a lot, and I think we have until six o'clock to network. Thanks a lot.